God just keeps on keeping on, doesn't he? I really, really, really don't know how to start this message. Um, I think I'll start it where I wound up at 8 o'clock. Um, got real personal with me at 8 o'clock at the conclusion of the service. So I think I'll open it up. Um, Kathy and I have been married about 10 years. And uh, pretty much I was an idiot. Um, For 10 years I was proud of probably as narcissistic uh, as any husband could possibly be. My words uh, were not tender, they were probably very, not probably, they were harsh most of the time, self-centered. Uh, all I cared about back then was uh, playing ball and preaching. Um, I was working 30 hours a week at Sears, uh, pastoring a church uh, full-time and going to church full-time. And if I had any time remaining, uh, I, was, I was on a field or in a court somewhere. And guess what suffered? Uh, My marriage suffered greatly. I'm going into a lot more detail than I did at eight, but um, led to a lot of extenuating circumstances that became very pervasive in our relationship. We had two children. And at one o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning, I'm... I'm, uh, with my wife and we're in the living room at one o'clock in the morning and we're trying to decide what we're gonna do. Are we going to make our marriage work or are we going to end it? It had gotten to that point that it was a defining moment, a defining moment. I can go back to very clearly uh, when we sat and we chose marriage. We chose it. Um, I don't regret that decision at all. But, but I want to talk to you this morning about um, how that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ can bring hope to a very diseased marriage. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and just kind of Hold your spot there. I'll be coming back to it in a few minutes. Uh, But you know as I do that that is the love chapter. Um, There are four kinds of love that's mentioned in the Greek. Two of them are mentioned in the Bible. One is the word phileos. That's a filial kind of love. It's when I would say... Um, I, I love Japanese steakhouses. I love my car. Um, I, I love David. Um, it's that kind of love that just kind of crosses over a lot of barriers. It is a brotherly <clears throat> kind of love. It can be in family or it can be uh, out of family. But then 142 times in the New Testament alone, there is the word agape that is used. Um, Agape kind of love is the word God uses over and over and over again to describe the kind of love that he has for us. The kind of love that he has for the church. But it is also the kind of love the word is used there that we are to have for our husbands and our wives. Uh, same kind. So in other words, as Christ loved the church, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Agape kind of love. Godly kind of love. It's amazing to me how that most of us Christians, we kind of pick and choose the relevancy of Scripture. We'll certainly agree 
uh, with the Bible when it says uh, we are to love one another as God has loved you. We, we, we are, that's exactly right. But then when it comes to the marriage, when it comes to husband-wife relationships, and God's using the same word there, we kind of hold that off at arm's length and say, well, yeah, well, maybe. Now, I am fully convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that if we can recapture in our, in our culture today, if we can recapture... By the way, one of the things that's really prompted this message to me, it's, it's been rolling over in my heart and my mind now for uh, weeks and weeks and weeks. As word from here and word from there, uh, this family splitting, this marriage breaking up. Then you read in the headlines when major denominational leaders uh, have had moral failures and have had to resign in these last few days. I, I believe it's a much needed message for this church. I, I believe it's a much needed message for our, our culture and our generation today. And I am convinced that if we can recapture what God is saying 142 times in the New Testament for our homes, we could see 95%, if not more, of our homes that are filled with disease be healed. I'm convinced of it. There are two characteristics of agape love. I know there's a lot more than that, but I want to give you two of them today. Agape love is the kind of love that has an undying commitment that refuses to be knocked down or badgered down by feelings. By feelings. Now, you know, hear my heart. The day that you stood... You stood in the presence of God and you stood in the presence of your mate and you said before God and your mate, till death do us part. That's a commitment. You made a vow to God. You made a vow to your spouse. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that we are to love our wives or love our husbands as long as we have feelings. I can't tell you the dozens and dozens and dozens of men and women that have crossed my path as a pastor and say something like, well, I just don't have any feelings for them anymore. Where does it say that you have to have feelings? What about the commitment? What about the vow? What about what you said before God and before your spouse? Where you got that was from some tabloid article that you picked up at the grocery store. The word says love. That's something that we are to do, not necessary to feel. You say, well, I don't feel like it. So does that relieve me? of some of the responsibilities that I have in that relationship? Absolutely not. You made a vow. You made a commitment. Now hold your spot. I'm going to come back to it in just a minute. Hold your spot in 1 Corinthians there in that 13th. I want you to go over to the weirdest probably passage that I've ever used for marriage. It's in 2 Samuel, and I want you to go to chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. There are two verses in there. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a background. David is assembling an army. They're about to go into battle. They're about to go into war. And he is assembling a bunch of soldiers together. And there's a guy that shows up that's not even a part of Israel's family, if you will. And, and he's wanting to join up and get involved in this war in this battle. He, he wants to be a part of the leader, if you will. Now, now look at verse 19. Then said the king to Ittai the Gittite. Now, how would you like to have a name like Ittai the Gittite? Hey, Ittai, how you doing? Okay, here we go. Wherefore goest thou also with us? Why, why are you, why are you want to go with us? Go on back home. Abide with the king. You're a stranger and an exile. You, you, you don't belong to the nation of Israel. 
Whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us, seeing I go whither I may? Return thou and take back thy brethren. Mercy and truth be with you. In other words, we don't need you here. You, 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 don't, you don't have any dog in this hunt. Well, why are you here? Go on back. But now I want you to listen because we could take verse, uh, what, what is it, verse 21? We could take verse 21 and we could apply it to our marriages very easy. Watch this in verse 21. It I answered the king and said, As the Lord lives and as my Lord the king lives, Surely in what place my Lord the King shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. That is a commitment. That's a vow. No matter what happens to you in this life, whether you live or whether you die, I am going to stick through it through thick and thin. I joined up to stay. I came to work. I'm not throwing in the towel when the going gets tough. Do you, do you know what biblical love? Here's a, another characteristic. B biblical love um, says I don't care how much the object of my love changes, uh, I'm going to love because I'm commanded to love. That's unselfishness. That's unselfishness. Uh, e even when you are giving out your love and you're getting nothing in return, there is no sense of gratification whatsoever from that relationship. Even though my love may be pounded into the pavement, I, I'm here to stay. W would you say and would you agree with me that's tough to do sometimes? You keep giving, you keep giving, you keep giving and there's no response, there's nothing back. And it just seems like the more you throw your love out there, the more somebody wants to just put it under their foot and grind it into the pavement and you're wondering, what in the world am I doing? Now back in 1 Corinthians, in that 13th chapter, I want you to look at verse 4. Love suffers long, love is kind, it's not puffed up. Love doesn't behave itself unseemly, it seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Do you know that sometimes the object of our love changes, doesn't it? Uh, I, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had some kind of time travel that we could see when we're in premarital discussions? Wouldn't it be wonderful if somehow Ladies, that God could show you what he's going to look like and be like 20 years down the road. Right now, I mean, he's physically fit, 30-inch waist, pumping iron, handsome as he can be, debonair as he is. But then you get to looking into this seeing eyeglass thing and you see him 20 years from now, he's bald-headed with a pot belly. He snores and burps and other loud noises along the way. <laughs> The object of the love has changed. Heard about an old boy, he loved the opera and he started going to the opera. He sat in the third balcony and he, and, and he listened to this soprano singing. She was, I mean, just swept him off his feet. He couldn't get over. He, he finally mustered up enough courage to meet her backstage and fell deeply in love with her from that third balcony all the way down. They had a whirlwind, just daily romance, got married on a whim, show up now, it's the wedding night. They're getting ready for bed, and she reaches up, takes out a glass eye, lifts off the wig, throws it over to the side, unscrews a wooden leg, and put, he's in total shock and didn't know what to say, and the first thing he could think about was, for Jesus' sake, woman, sing, sing, sing. <laughs> B 
Biblical agape love never ends. It goes on. Intrinsic love that love is on despite what changes may occur in the future. It's called commitment. Roy Croft wrote, I love you not only for what you are, but for what I am when I'm with you. I love you not only for what you've made of yourself, but what you're making of me. I love you for the part of me that you bring out. I love you for putting your hand into my heaped up heart and passing over all the foolish, weak things that you can't help daily seeing there and for drawing out into the light all the beautiful belongings that no one else had looked quite far enough to find. I love you because you're helping me to make out of the lumber of my life, not a tavern, but a temple, out of the works of my every day, not a reproach, but a song. Now I want to give you the second, not only a biblical kind of love, I want to talk to you about the dispensation of free forgiveness. Come here, let me just tell you a little something. There's absolutely no room in a marriage for harboring resentment and grudges and unforgiveness. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your relationship. Have you ever met somebody that's just always right? Even when they're wrong, they're never wrong. I heard about a couple in Iowa they were driving, going somewhere, and she looks at her husband, honey, you, you, you know, you're, you're on the wrong road here. I'm not on the wrong road. I know I'm where I'm going. I, this is right. I know I'm right. The interstate turned into a two-lane road. The two-lane road turned into a single dirt road, and it ultimately wound up in a cornfield, and they're going through the cornfield, and she looks over at him, and she says, you still think we're on the right road I'm always right about stuff like this you know anybody like that that's always right that they are never wrong somebody wrote that believe as I believe no more no less that I am right and no one else confess feel as I feel think only as I think eat what I eat and drink what I drink look as I look do always as I do and then and only then I will fellowship with you You understand that that kind of spirit and that kind of attitude breeds resentment when somebody crosses you. It breeds into animosity and it will develop into a grudge that is going to be nursed for many, many years in the marriage. I want to ask you a question. Is there something that has happened in your relationship either before you got married or right after you got married or 10 years as the case was us, 10 years into your marriage that happened that hurt you deeply? Uh, it, it, It really damaged that relationship. But somewhere along the way, you mustered up enough to be able to verbally say to your mate, okay, Uh, I forgive you. But then you stored it away in a tidy little compartment somewhere in your life. And then at the appropriate times along the way since then, you've been able to pull it out and to drag it up. And rehash it all over again. I want to tell you, God has a word for this. Look with me, if you will, at Ephesians, just a few pages toward Revelation in chapter number four, Ephesians chapter four. I want you to see verse 26, Ephesians chapter four. This is good stuff. And verse 26, Paul says, be angry, but don't sin. Deal with your wrath before the end of the day. Deal with it, handle it. Before the end of the day. But look at, look at with me if you will verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Don't put it into a compartment and store it up and use it at an appropriate convenient time in your life. Be, let, let, it, let it be put away with you with all malice. 
Don't, don't hold on to any portion of it. I want you to understand that the most destructive poison that penetrates marriages is that refusal to forgive, to release the resentment that we conveniently filed away, that we know where it is and we're able to pull it up and to use it as a club whenever we choose. I am appealing to every believer in this room here this morning. If you are harboring resentment, if you are holding on to a grudge, if there's some area of unforgiveness in your heart and your life, the first thing I want you to do is to go before God and ask God to forgive you for holding it over your mate or your spouse or that other person. And then at a very appropriate, convenient, intimate time when nobody else is around and its timing is right, get with that person and say, you know what? I told you a long time ago that I forgave you about but the fact of the matter is I haven't really forgiven and I haven't really let it go. I've never really put it away from me. And the fact of the matter is I've used it against you many times, but with God's help, I've asked him to forgive me and with his help, I'm going to let this go. I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Colossians, a couple more pages over toward Revelation. You're nearly there anyway. In the third chapter in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies and kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Let me help you now. Are you listening? I want to help you with something. Because this is, this is the way uh, that I have dealt with unforgiveness in my own heart. Um, I've told you many times my testimony it is the only way that I've ever been able to deal with these issues like this is I have to be reminded of everything that God forgave me of. And if you just get to thinking about what God forgave you of, then it makes it a whole lot easier to be able to forgive those that have wronged you. Okay? I believe with all of my heart, God wants to heal a lot of marriages today. Number three is the communication of positive words. Words are a blessing or they are a cursing. When I was growing up, there was that little popular phrase that was used all of the time. Well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Baloney. Words can crush you. Nothing more destructive than words. Folks, it makes a difference. The words that you use, and it makes a difference in the inflection of your voice and how you use them. Every day. All the time. It's not like, okay, honey, I love you. Now, how does that work for you? Mm. makes a difference. Communication is the most difficult challenge I, I believe that uh, we have facing us today. Do, do you know that the Bible tells us in Proverbs, turn, turn over that, I, just, I want you to see it. I, I don't want to just read it to you, I want you to be able to see it. Uh, in the wisdom writer, Solomon, in his writing, in Proverbs chapter number four, let's just read several Let's read several verses. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 24. Put away from you a froward or a destructive mouth and perverse lips put far from you. L look with me, if you will, at chapter 12 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 18. 
there is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. There, there, there are words that you can use that will absolutely lacerate. That's what he's saying here. That would lacerate the person that you are speaking to. But then there you have the choice to make. You can either lacerate with those words or you can use your words to bring about healing and health to the person. Look, look at uh, chapter 18, verse 19. Chapter 18 and verse 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Hey, hey, can I say something to you? Once you let it come out, it's out there. And you can say I'm sorry all you want to, but that's going to leave a scar in the heart of that person. That'll never go away. Look, look at uh, chapter 21, verse 19. This is, yeah, is going to get real personal here. It's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Hmm. It gets good. Or look at chapter 21, excuse me, chapter 25, verse 24. It's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Better to get on a dumb waiter and let it lift you up on the rooftop than it is to stay down there and quarrel and argue. One more, 27, 15. 27, 15. A continual dropping, drip, 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 drip. You ever heard a leaky faucet in the middle of the night? Drip. Drip, a continual dropping in a very rainy day, and a contentious woman are alike. I, you know, I heard a lot of men laughing. Did y'all notice that? How deep the laugh. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, men are worse than women. I knew I'd get amens out of that. <laughs> We, we were sitting not long ago having dinner out, and we were near this booth. My wife and I were having a, a nice meal together, and, and we couldn't enjoy our meal because this guy next to us that we could hear, he was constantly badgering his wife, would not let up, just kept on and on and on. We, we're talking here about a spirit of contention. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no place in the home for quarreling. If he, Colossians 4, 6 says that we are to let our speech be seasoned with grace. I want to ask you men something here today. How seasoned is your language with your wife? You say, why are you picking on the men? Because the fact of the matter is, men, listen, you and I are going to have to stand before a holy God one of these days and give an account of how we led our families. We're responsible. Our words can be used as a blessing or a cursing and degrading. I, I want to ask you, who are you? in your home when no one else is listening to how you're talking and what you are saying. Well, let me go on to number four. It's the demonstration of duty. Uh, demonstration of duty. Take your Bible and look with me to, to probably the, the most used passage of Scripture that I use when I am talking to a man and a woman about their marriage. Don't do much of that anymore, but here, here's, here's the passage that I, that I rely on very heavily. Uh, 1 Peter, I want you to look at chapter number 3. And I want you to listen to verse number 1. Likewise, ye wives, <clears throat> be in subjection to your own husbands. Now, we're talking about the duty. You say, I don't like the word duty. Well, I, I don't much like it either, but for the 
sake of the message today, I'm using that to describe the role that God has assigned to women. He says, women, I want you to be in subjection to your husbands. Now, he doesn't just stop right there. Powerful phrase, that, so that, in order for, the husband who is a non-believer can be won by the chaste or the pure, he uses the word conversation in King James, it's better translated behavior, by the, pure, by the woman who is fulfilling her God-assigned role, being in subjection to her husband, so that he can become the man that God ordained and assigned him to be. Now, I've, I've heard people take this completely out of context and apply it just to unbelieving husbands. That's not the intent of this passage. The intent of this passage is not only so that a lost husband could be saved, it has the intent of it so that he can become who God wants him to be. So you have a role, women, that you're to play, subjecting to the husband. Now watch verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Hey, men, notice the word dwell. It means to live with them. You know what the fact is? This is a fact. The fact is most men, they may be physically in the home, but they're not there. Emotionally, they're not there. Spiritually, they're not there. So he says, I want you to dwell with them. I want you to be present so that you can meet the needs of your wife. What are her needs? The weaker vessel so that her fears could be calmed and she could be secure in that relationship. Uh, so that uh, her role as a woman can be fulfilled. I, I'm going to tell you something. Hear my heart just a minute because I see this all of the time. I hear it all of the time and, and it's true. Nowhere in the word of God are you ever going to find where God ever said to one mate or the other to be, be the police of the role of your mate. Quit trying to police him. Quit trying to police her. You be who God assigned you to be and just watch what happens to your mate. Fulfilling those roles. Number five is the identification of the mutual enemy. I, I got to close with this. First Peter chapter number five, verse eight. Watch this. First Peter chapter five, verse eight. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Here's, here's the deal. One o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, I'm getting ready to preach that next morning. My wife and I finally came to grips with who the real enemy in our home was. And we realized it's not flesh and blood. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness that seeks to exalt themselves against us. There are five things that the devil is trying his best to do in your relationship. Number one, he wants to mock God's most precious creation, which is marriage. Number two, he wants to neutralize your testimony. If he can destroy your family, if he can get you separated in your relationship, you won't have much to say to a lost and a dying world. Number three, he wants to destroy the church. If he can destroy families, he can destroy the church. Number, th number four, 
He wants to afflict future generations. And you better know that the odds of your children divorcing go skyrocketing if your home separates and divorces. And finally, he wants to bring an ongoing misery into the relationship. The misery of an unhappy marriage. I'm going to finish now with number six. Is the recognition of unlimited power. Jeremiah chapter 32 asks the question and answers the question in verse 16. Is there anything too hard for God? And the overwhelming answer in Jeremiah says, there is nothing. Say the word nothing. There's nothing too hard for God. Not even to the healing of the most diseased, complicated, and complex marriage in the world. I've watched him time and time and time again do what man thought was impossible. God has the power to heal the most entangled of relationships. The only thing he's doing is looking for people who are willing to stand with him. Did you hear what I just said? He's looking for a husband who's willing to stand with God. He's looking for a wife that is willing to stand for God. If you know anything about my preaching... You always know that the last thing that I do in every message is give instructions on what I want you to do about what you just heard. My instructions today are this. Let's serve notice on the enemy today. Let's tell him something that he hates to hear. Let's tell him that he does not have unlimited power. Only God has unlimited power. And he has no authority over you as a child of God at all. That God is your authority. He's all powerful. And for him to leave you alone and rebuke him in the name of Jesus that we just sang about. Would you stand with me? Would you do that with me? I'm going to ask you men to do something today. But don't you do it unless you really mean it. I want to ask you to take your wife by the hand. I want you to bring her to the altar and just stand right here. Just stand right here. And by doing that, saying, today I'm taking my stand with the Lord and I'm taking authority over the enemy that's trying to destroy our relationship. In the name of Jesus, I want to be the man in my home that God would be pleased with and that would enable you as my wife to have and fulfill the role that God has assigned to you as well. I want to be that man. If you're in the balcony, we'll wait on you to come. This is so very important. Reach over, take your wife by the hand, bring her here to the front. Stand with her. If your wife's not with you, that's okay, you come on. I'm gonna be that man God wants me to be. If your husband, is not with you, that's okay. You come and take your stand and simply say, I'm gonna fulfill the role God has for me. I'm gonna be the woman God wants me to be so that my husband can see Jesus in me filled with the Holy Ghost. And by my pure behavior, by my stand, by the woman that I'm going to be, he'll ultimately also become who God wants him to be.